We looked at this document here, and you'll be able to get a copy of it. I'll put it into the network folder a little bit later. If you just want a copy of what I wrote for your records, these notes that I'm writing I will also add to the network folder a little later. <coughs> what we're going to look at next is you should have gotten a copy of the other document for today, Campus SEO 2 Webmaster Tools. Let's look at that one. You'll be able to print it on the next break, but open that Campus SEO 2 Webmaster Tools. If you get these pop-ups about the PDF, just try to cancel them out. So you have this document that is two pages long. We're first going to actually start with page two. Page one gives us the details about the Google and the Bing Webmaster tools. And let's first jump over, however, to page two. And I'll be writing some notes here. I believe we mentioned this terminology last time. If we didn't, our terminology is impressions, conversions, and CTR. Impressions. Did people see your content? Again, these generic terms, content. So that's going to apply to people see your website, or your tweet, or your video, or your blog post, your content. Did it show up on a Google search, a Bing search, a Twitter search, a YouTube search? Did your content, did people see it? That's an impression. Your content made an impression on someone. Then we've got a conversion. Did people interact? with your content. Seeing something is okay, but better is that someone interacted. And these interactions can be, for example, I tweeted something and a hundred people were... I got a hundred impressions, a hundred people saw it, but three people clicked on the link to buy the product. Impressions, conversions. The person was converted from simply seeing the tweet to clicking. That's a conversion. Yes? How do they know that somebody saw it? What are they measuring? The search engines and the social networks have some sort of proprietary system that can tell that because <laughs> they'll you'll see a, a screen full of content and the search engine can tell you know where your screen had moved in your mouse and such, and the and the and the um, social network can see that you had seen seven tweets here and you stopped. So the other ones don't aren't counted as a conversion as a as an impression that you never saw those tweets. Wow. So that's pretty advanced. But then what's more valuable is that they actually clicked. Sure. That's then that's the other one here, conversions. Uh, when we set up these webmaster tools, we will be able to see this. On the, one, on the one hand, it's sort of like, well, how does this work? That's not so important. Is it working for me? That's important, and that's what we'll set up in a moment. We will be able to see this stuff ourselves for free. But conversions are the ones that have more value when people interact. So I, I got a page of results. Um, Family-owned bakeries, and I was one of the ten. So I got an impression. Someone saw my link. Did someone click on it? No. Then it wasn't a conversion. Did someone click on it? Yes, that was a conversion. A conversion is just an action. Uh, so they were converted from a non-clicker to a clicker. They were converted from a non-buyer to a buyer. They were converted from a non-subscriber to a subscriber. So those impressions and conversions apply to everything. I've got a newsletter, and a lot of people see the button that there's a newsletter, but hardly anyone clicks. My conversions are very low on that. I've got a product that I'm selling. I've got a, a whole grid of products. Lots of impressions, 
people are seeing my products, are they clicking to buy? That became a conversion. I'm uh, posting stuff on Facebook, I'm getting impressions, people see it. Did click, people click like? That was an impression. Did people reply? I'm sorry, that was a conversion. Did people reply to my post? That was a conversion too. Converted from no reply to a reply. And that then becomes CTR, which is click-through rate. Which is a very simple formula. C divided by R. I, but divided by I equals CTR. Conversions divided by impressions equals click-through rate. Let's say impressions. 768 people saw my tweet. And 128 clicked it. Any math majors out there? Oh, so we have calculators. So 128 divided by 768. 0 0.16, which, you know, if we put that into a into a percentage, 16.7 percent. 16.67 percent. 16 percent, 16 and a half percent efficiency, you could say. 16 percent uh, return on investment. Um, one possible value that's telling me how effective I'm being. All my efforts on Twitter. I'm, I'm going to follow what the instructor said. I'm going to tweet every single day. Well, are you wasting your time or is it working? Twitter will be able to tell you all of these values, impressions and conversions and such. And you'll see, oh, I've been trying really hard and I'm not getting any results. I'm tweeting every day. But every day you're just tweeting like, how are you? How is everyone today? Is your day good? I love the weather. And it's not related to what your business is. It's not related to what you should be actually tweeting or posting. So maybe your conversion rate, CTR, is very low. <coughs> Thank you. So we will be able to see this, to see how effective we are. CTR, click-through rate. It's very common to have a very low CTR rate, 1.2%. It's going to be very common. And that's not bad, because what's bad? Zero CTR, right? No one is clicking on anything. If I have a 1%, Let's say that's 10 clicks. 10 clicks to sell a product? I sold 10 products? That's good. I could have potentially have 768 people buy the product and only 10 people bought it. Very low CTR. But that's 10 sales from a tweet. And I'm being very simplistic there that a tweet's going to get you a sale. There's still a whole... Uh, <coughs> process, a whole funnel that a potential client could go through, that they see your tweets, they subscribe to you, blah, 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 then eventually they buy. I'm simplifying it all the way down to they see your item, they want to buy it. It's way too simplistic. But we don't know any of this data yet. That's why we're going to spend a little bit of time to, uh, to set ourselves up to get these statistics. And also in the handout here, I've got some things to think about. If we look on page two, you must decide the goals of your company early on. In my fictional business, Victor's Bakery, I want people to buy my cupcakes. That's a conversion, conversion goal. In order to get to that goal, I have many conversions, before that point, let's talk about these. So ultimately, my main conversion that I care about is to sell a cupcake. Here's some possible things that I could do to get me to that point. I'm not saying do all of these things all the time. I'm saying these are possible things for you to think about and do to help you get to that goal. <coughs> to sell a cupcake. To get called for a con to give a free consultation. To get uh, a potential lead so that I can sell them something or get a donation or whatever you're trying to do online. Maybe I simply want people to read my amazing um, you know, blog posts all about traveling. Well, I can still think about all of these things here. Let's see these examples. Get followers on Twitter or any social network. Here I'm saying um, 
Twitter followers. Got a captive audience. The more followers that you build on any network, some percentage of them will be your most passionate followers. You can think of it as the 1% follower rule. Out of the number of followers that you have, 1% are going to be the ones that are most passionate, or tangibly, the ones that are going to be most want to actually buy something, subscribe to you, complete that conversion, the ultimate conversion. It's a very low number. It's a very high bar. 1%. I've got a thousand followers. What's 1% of a thousand? 10,000. 10. 10 people out of a thousand. I thought I had a thousand followers. I thought I had a thousand likes on Facebook. I thought I had a thousand followers on Instagram. 10 of them, most likely, are going to be the ones that are really going to click the buy button. Because it's very easy to click the, the favorite button, it's very easy to click the reply button, but then suddenly the mouse gets so difficult to use on the buy button. And so 1% is a very realistic goal. That's why companies want to get as many followers as possible. It comes down then to the lowest number there. And yes, you might have an amazing product. You might run your social media really well. You might have a lot of passionate followers, and yours is more like 25% even 25% out of a thousand followers. Okay, 50%. 50% out of a thousand followers is still 500 people. It's not, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship that all your 100 followers are going to buy your product. What's 1% of 100? One person. So the more people that you get as a follower, your captive audience, 1% of them will be the one most passionate, more, most um, serious, to buy your product, follow your newsletter, donate to your nonprofit, and that's going to vary a lot again depending about what your ultimate conversion is. If I'm simply a blogger that wants people to read my articles, that's a much easier goal to get than I want people to buy my self-help book. If I'm giving it away in a blog, I can <coughs> reach that conversion a lot easier than selling that $12 book on Amazon, the conversion rate will be a lot lower. We've got get social interactions on Facebook, and I've listed likes, shares, comments. Let's see Facebook. Um, I'll put them in the order uh, better of uh, of likes, comments, shares, follows. Facebook terminology doesn't exactly match up to what I said here, but the, this terminology matches up to just about every other social network besides Facebook. You have likes on Twitter, you have comments on Twitter, shares and follows. So you also have that on Instagram and LinkedIn and all of that. You have those sorts of four actions on just about every network. It's so slightly different on Facebook. A person can like your post or like your whole page. If they like your whole page, that's a bit more like a follow on Twitter. If they just like one thing that you posted on Facebook, that's different. That's like giving a like to one tweet on Twitter as opposed to following the whole Twitter account to see all your tweets. So I'm trying to get all of these interactions on Facebook or any network because this is showing you that captive audience that is more serious. Anyone can click I put them in this order because of the value. Anyone can click to like that tweet, that snap, that post on Instagram. And a like is very short attention span. It's very transitory. Someone clicks that like, moves on, what's next? What's the next cool picture for me to look at and like? What's the next cat video for me to like? What's the next um, article to click like and halfway read? What's next with a like? So it's not bad. Likes are good. It's not bad. What's bad is nothing. Doing nothing is bad. If your content is getting none of these, that's bad. Getting likes is good. What's better is a comment. Someone took the time to click reply, 
or comment, to take a moment to write something, hopefully half intelligible rather than yeah or yes. Hopefully something like, I like that, I didn't know that, thank you for this, I'm gonna tell more friends about it. You know, something more complex than just a, a thumbs up emoji. Uh, but a comment still has a little more value than a like because someone took more effort than simply a like and move on. This is showing a particular follower that is more valuable. They're more interested in your product and message. And in the social media class we would talk about, okay, what further do we do with these? How do we reach out to them more directly? In the real world, companies would love it that they've got their billboard up there and then you see the billboard and let the company directly know, somehow, I really like that billboard. I'm thinking about that plumber. Then they would reach out to you as soon as possible to say, here's a plumber coming to you next week, 10% off. Social media, we can do something like that. Once we know who is interacting with us, we can reach out to them directly, get the ball rolling, get a conversion. Share is another level up because this is free advertising. I posted something on Facebook. I had, let's say, 10 followers on Facebook, to simplify it. I have 10 followers on Facebook. Potentially, 10 people saw that. One of those people liked that post enough that they shared it to their 40 family members. So I sort of now reached 50 people, the 10 directly that followed me, and 40 more that were shared to. But what if one of these followers on Twitter has a thousand followers and they retweeted my tweet? I had 10 followers on Twitter, one of them has a thousand, I reached potentially a thousand ten people. I let someone else share my stuff and be free advertising, free marketing for me. I want that. And the last one here on social media is a follow. I want them to follow me on Snapchat. I want me, them to follow me or subscribe to me on YouTube. I want them to be that captive audience again, to build the audience for that 1% so that gets larger and larger and larger. So I mentioned Facebook, but that applies to all the networks. I want that on all my networks, my LinkedIn. I want that on my Yelp. I want that on... Um, um, you know, everywhere. On my own website, too. Then I've got get site visits via Google+. There's another, yet another social network. This one is from Google. This one's a big one. Um, Google Plus is valuable because it's tied to Google Local. We saw this last week when we did a search for the competitors. We saw that for local results especially, some results appeared as plain old text and some appeared like dots on a map. I want to be like that. I want to stand out like those other dots on the map, not like the guys down there they are just text. To get like that, to be on a map, Google Plus, which is free. Google Local, it's got different kind of names. But I want to get on Google Plus, I want to create an account there because when people search on Google, guess what? It's going to want to promote uh, or give preference to the Google properties a little higher than the other ones from the other networks. Google and Facebook are not friends. They're competitors. And even though each one of them protests, we have to assume that their algorithm favors their own products as opposed to the competition, even though they're going to tell you our algorithm is perfect and it's not going to cheat and you're going to get the best results. Over and over, we've seen results do get skewed. When you're the 800-pound gorilla, you can make the rules in the playground. So, okay, I know the rules, I'm gonna play the, by the rules. I'm gonna create a Google Plus so that I can put my company address there, I can put my phone number there, I can put um, the street address and contact info on the Google Plus. Maybe I don't have time to use it every week. Maybe once a month I add something to Google Plus. But my competitor never heard of Google Plus, never touched it, and I'm getting higher because I'm playing their game, I'm putting content there, and I'm rising above the competitor that didn't try it, doesn't know about it. People can leave reviews, get directions. 
you have a Google Local or Google Plus, people can leave a review, and that's a whole big discussion for later. And uh, we talked about it some last week, remember? A good review is good, and a bad review can be good too. And if you've got a local company, Google will give you free directions. I'm on my mobile device, I need to find the business, I look it up, it gives me directions. Because I put an address. I put an address there. Now, obviously that doesn't apply for everyone. What if I'm a virtual business without a real office? Well, I can't take advantage of that, but I can get reviews. I can still get that aspect of things. We've got uh, get more hits on my home page. That's basically website. Get more traffic to my website, which sounds funny. I want to get more traffic to my website, so I need to first get more traffic to my website. Circular logic. Unfortunately, it is, it is true to some degree. Uh, popularity breeds popularity. Traffic breeds traffic. Positivity breeds positivity. So if I'm trying to get traffic to my site, first I need traffic to my site. And then it feeds into itself. I'm trying to get traffic through Twitter, through Facebook, through Google, etc. So I'm starting to build traffic. That traffic builds more traffic. The search engine C, this website, gets, is getting traffic compared to the competitor. Let's rank them a little higher. But to, what to say about this also is uh, your website gives you the ultimate control of your online presence. When you create an account on Twitter, Facebook, etc., there's a huge terms of service that no one reads but everyone agrees to. Depending on the network, and apparently other factors, you, your account on these networks could be shut down at the drop of a hat. You've spent all of this time on any of these networks, you violate a terms of service, they shut you down. And there's very little recourse for you to fix that unless you're huge. And even big personalities on these networks sometimes have a hard time dealing with that too. So I've been using Twitter for a while, I do something wrong somehow, and then I get the account shut down for a few hours, or permanently, and that's a big hassle. There's all my 10,000 followers, my 1% of, of an ardent audience. I'm over on YouTube, and I'm creating these, I've been creating videos about my company. And let's say, in one of my videos, I play copyrighted material. The YouTube uh, s computers are pretty advanced, but on the one hand, they can be very harsh in that they see copyright violations and right away you get a notice. There's a copyright violation on your video. It's happened to me while teaching these classes. When I teach these classes and I play a video on YouTube, I often get an, a message from YouTube saying, we've heard copyrighted material on your video. So I'm simply playing someone else's video and YouTube has a problem with that. So I have to fill in a little form that say, I'm teaching at a college, showing examples of YouTube, fair use. I say, okay, sorry, and then they leave the video alone. So what I'm getting at is, if you have your own website, if you're paying for your own website, if you have your own content on your own server, you have the ultimate control here. You can put whatever you want on it, use it how you want, set it up how you want, customize it how you want. Because Facebook doesn't give you a lot of customization. They give you a little icon and a background graphic. I wanted a cool beige background. No, you get the white background like everyone else. On Twitter, I want to customize some of the colors and such. Well, you get six colors to choose from, and you can choose an extra color, but you can't change the columns. They have to be left column, right column. Your website gives you the ultimate control for design and branding and content. Because I can tweet about a product that I'm selling, but I can't sell the product from the tweet. I can show off one of my products on Pinterest, but at the moment I cannot sell my product directly on Pinterest. They're working on these technologies, they're not there yet. But guess what? On my website I can create an e-commerce website and sell my product 
for however I want with whatever commissions I want. I'm not going to get, you know, uh, charge the commission from selling if I'm over on eBay, Craigslist, Pinterest, whatever. I have the ultimate control on my website. So I still want to get traffic to my website. People sometimes come to the class and say, do I still need a website? I can do really well on Instagram and Facebook. Yes and no. Again, what are you trying to do online? If you're trying to sell that product, you're not going to be able to build a shopping cart in Twitter. You're not going to be able to build a shopping cart in Facebook, really. You're going to build it on your site. You're not going to violate the terms of service of Facebook. They can change it whenever they want, and they do, and sometimes they get worse. I was just reading an article a few days ago saying that you know one news organization asked to Facebook directly about copyrights of content. Someone was asking, you know, a news organization asked Facebook tech support, and they said, oh, basically everything you upload to Facebook now belongs to Facebook. The news organiza organization asked a different representative on a different day, and that representative said something different. They said, the content that you upload to Facebook is your content, but we have the right to reproduce it wherever we want. That's a different answer than what the first one said. The first one you know, was a person that gave an answer that thought was the right answer, but the first person said, we own whatever you upload to Facebook. The better second answer was, you own your stuff, but we can show it anywhere we want. On your own website, you own your stuff. You can do what you want with your stuff. And yes, there are terms of service still when you buy your website on GoDaddy or Bluehost or whatever, but those are much more lenient than these networks. So you should still have a website, most likely. Uh, get more shares on my blog posts from my site. So this one assumes you've got a blog. blog. You have a blog. Um, articles. Writing articles on your site. So that would be something like drewsbakery.com <coughs> slash blog. Or sometimes, depending on your, the setup of your site, you could have blog.victorsbakery.com. Either way, the articles that you're writing are on your site, which is different than Victor's Bakery dot WordPress dot com. You can go get a free website, a free blog at WordPress dot com. You can go get one at Blogspot. You can get a free blog at LinkedIn. Facebook now has blogs as well. You can get a, a blog anywhere else. The recommended one is a blog on your site, whatever the address is, but it's on your site. Because when that article gets found and shared and gets famous, the traffic is going to go to the Facebook. It's going to go to the WordPress.com. It's going to go to the LinkedIn. Rather than directly to your website where you're selling your product, where you have more articles, where you have the donate button. So if you have a blog right now on some other network, it's OK. But what's better is that you've got it on your site. If you have it on someone else's site like that, you have to make sure that you make it obvious and easy for people to still click something to go back to your main site. In the About page, for example, of, the, of that external site, or whatever way that you can tell people that, uh, hey, go back to my real site. Maybe have a preview of the article on the .com, wordpress.com, and then guide them back to the full article on your website. But this assumes you have articles, you have blogs. Take the blogging class, and in there we talk about that in detail. We talk about brainstorming ideas for people, what to write, how to write, how to optimize your writing and all of that. But every company could have a blog. Every company should have a blog. Because again, content. When I say that the search engines care about 
your site and such, they care about it that it is new and current and relevant and updated. And that doesn't mean changing your logo again every few months. That doesn't mean changing the one welcome text on the home page a few every few months. That means content, new original content on your site every once in a while. Evergreen content that people can come back to often, whereas social media it's like a it's like a river. It keeps going and going. That tweet that I posted, that Facebook post that I posted a month ago is getting buried in the new stuff coming out. If I create a blog and I organize it with categories and all that, people can keep finding my content easier than scrolling and scrolling and scrolling back through your posts. And if you're on Snapchat, what's the big draw about Snapchat? What's the big differentiator? Snapchat. Everything you post on Snapchat disappears at a certain point. It goes away. It's not there anymore at all. So companies are trying to figure out, how do I use Snapchat for a business if it just goes away? Well, oftentimes that's because it's also coupled with some other presence that is more permanent. Get subscribers to my coupon newsletter. That one assumes a newsletter. That's like subscribe, some sort of subscribe button to a newsletter. WordPress lets you do that very easily. Most modern web design software lets you do something like this also, letting people subscribe. Subscribe to your, there's two kinds here, subscribe to your blog so that when someone, when you post a brand new blog post, they will get an email that says, Victor's Bakery posted a new article. That's one version of subscribe. The other subscribe is more of a more powerful, robust, you know, email distribution list. Yes? Would you recommend a blog versus a news page on your website? I would call those the same thing. Different name, same thing. You're uploading news, what's new, what's different, and so forth. That's a blog. It's new articles you're adding to your site on a regular basis. That's a blog. So name doesn't matter, they both are the same thing. Subscribe for new articles. Keep up to date. What I'm getting at here is these are examples of how you're going to entice people to subscribe. If there's simply a little box on your site in the corner and it says subscribe and nothing else, how are you going to convince people? Why are you going to convince people to subscribe? You know that your newsletter and your blogs and all of that, your news and such, is amazing, but no one else does simply by subscribe. If you're telling them, subscribe for new articles, keep up to date, subscribe for tips, keep up to date with coupons. If I have something that says subscribe for the latest coupons, subscribe for exclusive content, how are you convincing people? How are you marketing to them, advertising to them? To convince them, give us your email. Because we're asking them to give you, to give us their email, captive audience. Once you have that email, you can of course properly, judiciously, non-spammy, send them emails about a new sale, about a new product, about up to date, you're a VIP, etc. But they will quickly, quickly click on subscribe if it's not relevant content, if it's um, off topic, if it's not useful to them. Tell them it's useful because you're about to subscribe to new articles, to coupons, to VIP access, to whatever. An example of this is I'm subscribed to the Fry's Electronics newsletter, and I love it and I hate it. Because every time I get that newsletter, I want to buy something. In that newsletter, it says, here's what's for sale, here's your exclusive coupon for discounts on these products. And I love Fry's Electronics. It's the happiest place on earth, after all. So I get that newsletter, and I want to buy something. I'm enticed. So what are you going to have on your newsletter to entice people to subscribe and give you their email address? Get virtual clients or followers to come to my physical location. This doesn't apply to everyone. This is location. If you have a physical location. 
how can you get people to visit? I might have a product that I have to sell exclusively in the store, Victor's Cupcakes or Victor's Bakery. I'm not selling my cupcakes throughout the U.S. They're, they're going to get damaged and the food regulations and all of that. So I only sell my baked goods locally on Main Street. So I've got 10,000 followers on Twitter. I've got 5,000 likes on Facebook. That'd be amazing if I had 5,000 customers to come in. But some of those likes on Facebook are not even in the city, not even in the state or the nation or the hemisphere. So again, this isn't applied to everyone. But I want people to come to my store on Main Street. I want to turn some of those subscribers over on Facebook. I want to convert them into visiting my location. Obviously, easier said than done. It's very easy to click follow. It's very easy to click reply. It's so much harder to get out of uh, the man cave, get in the car, and drive down the street to get that cupcake. So uh, you have to figure out how can I entice people to come over to your location. And you are able to search in Facebook. You are able to target in uh, Instagram and Twitter. You are able to target local people. You can search on these networks and zero it into a city or zip code and see these are all of the people that are posting about cookies in 91914. Let me tweet directly to them. Let me post something on Instagram directly to them. Let me reach out to them directly. I'm down the street. Come to the business. So thinking about location services, location features is something that would be valuable for many people here if you've got a local business. Use local search to target customers. And then somehow you have to entice them. I could do something like once I find all of these people posting within the zip code and I'm seeing that they're posting about baked goods and food and all of that, I could post some message directly to them and say, you know, oh, I see that you like cookies. You should try ours. Here's a 10% coupon off your first purchase. So taking that virtual client, that person that's on, you know, on the computer as pixels, and having them come directly to your, to your business with some enticement. Lastly, all of this is in the service of buying a cupcake. The more of these that I think about and do, the more I'm getting toward the ultimate conversion of selling that cupcake. You should see that it's a long, involved process to get from point A, a potential client follows you on Twitter, to point Z, the follower visits the store and buys the product. That's why search engine optimization goes hand in hand with search engine marketing. Also an emerging term that takes both into account is content marketing. You can go follow that link for more examples, more ideas on how to reach an audience. And so when the social media thing was, was rising, people would say, I just need followers and if each one of those followers I can get them to buy, I'm going to be on Easy Street. I've got a thousand followers. I could make a business on a thousand people. If all of those people even donated a dollar to me every month, I'd be raking in a thousand dollars of income off Twitter. It hasn't worked that way. It's one percent or so of people that are really going to be passionate enough to buy your product or sign up or read see your art, whatever you're doing online. Yes. Yes. So if um, Facebook or the other sites at a minimum are saying that you are licensing your photographs or art or whatever you're putting on, then maybe you don't want to put them there. Does it violate their terms for you to invite people onto your website using their social media? Um, I'm sure there are nuances to that. Um, I haven't looked at like the latest versions of all of these terms of services, 
but to my knowledge, no, it shouldn't be a problem that you're having people going over to your to your own website. Um, I haven't really heard of many examples of of something bad happening from that. I haven't really heard of people's sites, Facebook sites, getting shut down because they're just bringing people back to their main site. I don't doubt that has happened, and it probably will happen. And again, I don't know exactly the term service of all of these networks, but in all of our dealings with real clients, we've never had any kind of problem like that. So these are various things to think about here about conversions and goals and such. I'm going to show two websites related to this and then we will jump back to page one and actually do that section. So any questions on this that I've said so far? Go ahead and open up your web browser and let's go to a website of uh, one of my colleagues. Let's go to the website brand gfx graphics brand graphics dot com slash blog let's go check out the blog of this marketing company one of our colleagues brand graphics dot com brand gaf gfx dot com slash blog let's go take a look quick look at the blog On the right side, we are going to search for the keyword comprehensive. There's a particular article that I want to pull up here. Comprehensive. So this company is a marketing company. They're in the business of doing marketing. And what they've got here then is a variety of articles regarding concepts of social media and marketing and all of that. They're giving away free information, and this is the basic purpose of these blogs, to create content. So when someone searches for something like the value of blogging, I go on Bing and I type the value of blogging, this site may show up because it's got this content that's being put out there that is valuable to what you need, has activity, get some comments and such. So in short, that's why we need blogging, creating content to help us get found, to build authority, you should find the article called The Comprehensive List of Ways to Market Your Business. Let's take a look at that article. It was originally published in March 2013, but it has been updated with new content. That's something that sometimes people don't know about blogging. Yes, I am saying you're going to blog on a regular basis original content, but you can update old articles with new information and share those again. I wrote an article about some topic. I shared it on Facebook and on Twitter, everywhere, and it got me some traffic. Then like six months later, 12 months later, I come back to the article, I see what has changed, what's wrong now, what do I need to add to it, and then I mark it that it's been updated and share it again on Twitter. The people that have never seen it, I've gained more followers on Snapchat, so I'm gonna share it to brand new people. The people that have seen it before will then know there's a new update to it, something new. Let me go read it again. More traffic. So you can repurpose your older content. Best practice is to mark that it's been updated. Uh, so this article, um, it says, yes, we know this list is by no means comprehensive. Our apologies, which is a better name than the almost comprehensive, always expanding, never a complete list of ways to market your business. But these are ideas. And there's a comment section at the bottom for you to add to it if you have more ideas. But these are ideas that you can engage in, again, to build your online presence, to market your business, your company. Some are digital, some are analog. You know, some you do on a computer, some are in the real world. Just kind of jumping around word of mouth and such networking, like in network groups, referral sources. Now this would be the perfect article if these were linked with examples, if these had explanations of all of these. I don't know what an advertorial is. 
So this would be the perfect article if it went that deep into detail. But guess what? In most web browsers, you can select a word, right click, and you'll probably have a built-in search. So I would love to know what a webinar is. Right click it, search it. But these are various examples of things to think about. Again, have you thought simply of word of mouth? Have you talked to real people? Or have you talked to people on your networks, on your LinkedIn? You, you have all of these connections on LinkedIn. Have you been tapping into them? Have you thought about pay-per-click? Remember I said day one, we have organic SEO, we have paid SEO. The paid SEO is the easy way, the organic in this class is the hard way. But the paid way is still valuable. Pay some amount of money, picking $100 out of thin air, $100 to help us get the ball rolling, to help us start to get found. Some amount of people are going to skip those ads, of course. Some amount are going to click. And perhaps you're going to recoup that $100 very quickly from those clicks. Magazine articles, infomercials, product spotlights, webinars, podcasts. So more content for you to create. Have you heard of podcasts? Raise your hand if you've heard of podcasts. Podcasts are basically internet radio shows. A classic radio show is I have to turn on the radio, I have to tune in at the right day and time to hear the episode. A podcast is basically your device, so your computer, your laptop, your phone, subscribes to the show, and when the new episode comes out, it automatically downloads to your device and you hear it. That's a podcast. Anyone can create a podcast for free. And it's like a little radio show about your business. And you would say, I don't know at all what I would be talking about. The great thing about it is that it's still rather the, the Wild West about it. It's very open. It is what you want it to, to be. It's more marketing. Going to, going to conferences, volunteering, sponsorships, direct mail, vehicle wraps. Do you have your company logo on your car? You could do that. Obviously some of these are more costly than others. Find a university or professional course in your arena and offer to be a guest speaker. Let's say you're, you have years of experience in, in uh, real estate. Let's say there's some sort of organization that would like guest speakers about being a first-time homeowner. You probably have that experience. You can go give a free talk as a, a, in that expertise. Guaranteed, at the end of the day, everyone's going to come up to you and ask for your business card. You give 50 business cards away to call you. Well, two out of 50 could be still valuable. If you didn't do it, it would have been zero out of 50. That's the same thing like Twitter. I have 50 followers, but two clicked. In the real world, I gave out 50 business cards and two called me. Is that good or bad? Two calls is two calls out of giving away some business cards. So I would check out this article, research these different topics, think about engaging in these various things. And then notice, short on time, receive our concise and easy to digest marketing quick tips delivered directly to you weekly via email. That's that email subscription. It could have simply said subscribe. But here, hopefully, it's selling it to you quick tips. I don't have time. I'm running my business and I hear my instructors say I've got to get on social media. But quick tips I can digest. So let me subscribe. one more website. Any questions on this one? There's a whole world and a whole big lecture and a class to talk about social media.
So let me direct you to a very valuable social media website that I like. This is one of these journals on, on topics to keep up to date with all of this. People ask me, how do you know all of this? My short answer is, well, when you have 15 years experience, you pick stuff up. But if you don't have 15 years of experience or time, you can go to something like one of these journal websites to keep up to date. Here's one that I like. SocialMediaExaminer.com Go to socialmediaexaminer.com. <coughs> this is a website all about social media, obviously. They want to <coughs> right away get your email. The way they entice you is with a free copy of the Social Media Marketing Industry Report. You've gathered this information. You're going to get a free book for exchange of your email. Then they're going to you know, send you messages and such. You can then un unsubscribe, but this is a very good way to do it. Give people a reason to give away their email address. The latest one here. Four ways visual content improves social media results. Nine time-saving tools for social media marketers. That's what I need. I have no time. Click on that. Number one. Notifier, lead feeder. So these are like websites and services. These are tools, apps that will quickly help me manage social media. Then I'm also going to get this pop up about an ad. This company has a uh, sponsors actually. Let's see if I see it right here. I don't know where is it. Uh, it might have already passed, but there's a social media conference that this website is involved in. In that conference, I can't find it here. I think it's sold out now. When I taught this class a couple of months ago, we looked at it. And that conference was like a $2,000 conference, and it was sold out. So this website has this arm where it's all this free stuff that you can do yourself, but I don't have time to do it. So you can hire them, you can go to the conference, educate yourself more, all of that. They also have a presence, they've got an about page right there. Who are these people? I'm going to read all about them. The world's largest social media marketing resource. Help millions of business owners. Our mission. More about us. Check out our podcast. Watch some videos. Here it is, the Social Media Success Summit. All this about information, creating the uh, authority based on content. So you can browse the home page and see the latest uh, articles or you can um, do search let's say you want to look up a particular keyword you can search it have you heard of Periscope Periscope today was a very big deal Periscope is a live sharing live video sharing app and website. YouTube is a very famous video sharing site. But classic YouTube is that I create a video, let's say a five minute long video, and then I upload it and people view it on YouTube. The next generation of that is live broadcasting. With Periscope, for example, I download the app to my device, I turn it on, and then I have a live TV show. 
I can show my business, I can talk to an audience, I get followers and subscribers and, and comments and all that. It's another social network, but it's focused on live video. That might be very cool for, uh, you know, I have Victor's Bakery and I also have Twitter and I've been tweeting for a week straight telling people, this Friday, tune in, tune in live, 3 p.m. Pacific time, we're going to take you behind the scenes. And every, every other day or whatever, I'm mentioning that on the Twitter or I'm mentioning it on the Facebook. I'm building awareness. And, and buzz for that. So I'm getting more subscribers over to the to the to the Periscope, and I'm showing people the kitchen. Okay, great. What's what's so great about that? Captive audience. I'm gonna talk to them and say, and here we're building our three-layer cake. Our favorite kind of flour is this arrowroot powder. Click the link below to get 10% off your next order. Talk to that audience that has chosen to tune in at that point. Imagine what the you know what Netflix would would do or the traditional companies imagine NBC and CBS they would kill to be able to talk to you one on one when you're watching your shows and sell you something here we have that on periscope and these other live video sharing sites YouTube now has a version of that too and today YouTube was a I mean periscope was a big deal I don't know if you heard about it and I don't want to get too off topic but today, if you had, if you didn't hear, there was a big to-do that happened in Congress, in the uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, big long story. But the short of it is that C-SPAN, the TV channel C-SPAN, was shut down. Guess what? A representative turned on Periscope and showed live what was going on. If C-SPAN couldn't show what was going on, this representative turned on Periscope, and thousands of people were tuning in to watch what's going on in Congress right now. Again, politics is a thorny issue, so you look up what happened. But Periscope um, was a big deal today, subverting the old paradigms for free. So think about it for your own company, how you could take advantage of that. And then there's an article that came, that came out you know, recently about this stuff. Periscope saves live video beyond 24 hours. So that's how you learn, all, you learn all of this stuff. You keep up to date with websites and blogs about this stuff. You subscribe and you follow, and um, you read about it and you implement it. Does anyone have an opinion on other, on other kind of sites like this that you might like to visit? Yes? Let, let, me answer, let, let, let me answer the question here first. Does anyone have any other website that you'd like to to browse regarding social media. Okay, social media examiner is the big one, I think, so that's a good one to go into. Question? I'm confused by this website. The way they branded themselves, mm -hmm. I, it, at first I thought it was one giant ad. There's something very, it's like a, the Comic Sans version of websites. Like it's very childlike and it's so full of stuff. I don't know if what I'm seeing is actual articles or if they're all advertisements. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on that? It's confusing to me. He yeah, they're. Voice well, yeah, he's a little adventurer. Navigating the jungles of social media, that's their branding, I guess. It might not be the most powerful branding, it might be too childish and juvenile. That's the particular personality and voice and values that they had developed. And for some audience, that's going to turn them off. And for some audience, they're going to like it. That's why in that document we talked about here at Company Profile, they did a version of that and figured out, we want to be like this. We want to be very jovial, and we want to be like very kid-like about these topics. And any other business maybe is going to be much more serious. I personally, I kind of like it. I think it's cool and interesting. But I can see how it can be very complicated in that. Is this an ad? Is this an article? This looks exactly like that. I, I'm going to ignore the sidebar because it's usually ads, but then this one right in the middle looks like an ad, so I'm going to ignore it. Oh, and now that I look at it carefully, oh, it's something I should have read. So yeah, this site, perhaps some audience members are not going to like it, and that, that's okay. So, so that's a really good point to put and emphasize what um, Victor was saying about voice. I like this because it's playful. And so it makes, and it has very, very good content, but it makes the content playful and not serious and boring to me. So it, it's a good example of the voice that they've chosen. Yeah, so it's still going to come back to the content. And the content 
on your site should also be the most valuable thing. The design and all that is important, but it's also the content. I just noticed here that on some pictures, the little guy here, notice the design of the character, and then on this one, he looks a little bit more realistic. So even maybe on their own branding, there's slightly different versions of the character. But overall, it definitely has this style to it. Here's another, this is not exactly just social media, but if you go look at the next web.com, this is more about in general about technology and see, there's a periscope that just happened today. Their, their, t their tagline up at the top says international technology news, business, and culture. So there's their tagline for their business. The next web makes me think, are they a company all up in, uh, interested in inventing artificial intelligence? The next version of the web, the future? Not that far. It's about international business, technology, culture. So it's not only going to focus on social media. It's going to have a variety of tech stuff. But I like visiting here also because um, it's got all this technology. News and such. And there's categories, apps, gear, tech, creative. So um, I'm going to take one more break, and then uh, we will do this this top part here. We've got a lot to think about and process with what we've talked about. Uh, so let's take one more break. It's uh, 8:36. We'll be back at 8:46, and then we'll go on.